And so let's take a moment and turn our attention to a dream. Our dreamer is a 29-year-old male who works as a project manager, and he has titled his dream, Trapped in the Company. I am the newest addition to a historic preservation crew improving temples and schools of a bygone people and culture in the Sierra Nevada mountains. These spaces are empty to the naked eye. Each night, spirits and creatures come to haunt us, to harass and molest us. We are not welcome here. I am not directly bothered. However, as we make our deeper way into the Sierra, the nights grow more dangerous as we sleep at the job site. Some members of the outfit, more senior than me, abandon the job. They face ridicule from the other bosses who choose to continue onward. I'm scared and question my own allegiance to the company and why I'm even here at all as time goes on. A result of the nightly hauntings are the breakouts of severe acne on my colleagues' faces. They are bruised, irritated, and increasingly unrecognizable as each day passes. I ask why this is happening. I only receive cryptic responses. No one tells me exactly what is upset with us, exactly what it is we appear to be disturbing at a profound level. I feel increasingly trapped a hostage of this company's message, mission. No one will come clean about what we're doing here. Frustration and fear grow over the life of the dream to no resolve. And for context, he writes, I am increasingly frustrated by an ideology that has entered my workplace in the last three years. I feel an increasing expectation to perform in accordance with this new ideology, which I disagree with personally. The main feelings in the dream for him were being trapped and being denied the truth of the situation. And he adds a few associations. Contractor work, he associates with animosity about the nature of being dispensable as a temporary employee and excavation and renovation of something misunderstood, he associates with a disdain for the arrogance he perceives in those who think they know how to improve something that they have little or no experience with. Mm. Um, I, have, I, have, I have big reactions to this dream. <laughs> okay, go for it. Uh, so first of all, I think it's a pretty profound dream and it strikes me that it's one of those dreams that's possibly for the collective and not just this individual, you know, they're, well, where to start? First of all, his comment about the kind of arrogance of people trying to, um, fix something that's really ancient. So I, I kind of got that in the dream too. It's like, whoa, these are temples and you're, you're, you're desecrating them somehow, you know, and, and some some element in the temple is is responding to that. And in, in terms of ideology, which I think is everywhere in our culture right now, I think a lot of people are kind of mired in ideology. And the thing about it is when that happens to you, you usually don't see it because you, you think you're just right. And I mean, I'm saying that being totally aware that I could be trapped in an ideology that I don't see, right? I mean, I try to be vigilant about that, but it's very hard not to be. So um, I, I think that there's, you know, ideology of all kinds in our society right now really holding sway. And there's actually something about this dream that reminds me of many of the dreams in this book called The Third Reich of Dreams by, uh, the name will come to me, oh, um, Barat, B-E-R-A-D-T. So this, um, I think her first name was Charlotte Barat. Anyway. She was a journalist in Nazi Germany, and she was not a psychologist. She went around and she collected people's dreams, like during Nazification. It's a, mm. it's a really interesting book. It's very expensive now because it's out of print, but I've, I've read the whole thing. 
She doesn't interpret the dream psychologically, but there is this sense of kind of something stifling that almost like the psyche can't really, uh, can't give full expression to something. Something's being trapped and stuffed in, Be, you know, and the sort of sense you get from reading these dreams, because they're actually most of them, like most of them are quite boring, actually. And, and you get the sense that what's, um, what, what was true then was that the imposition of uh, Nazi ideology was so stifling that it even stifled people's dreams. Mm. Oh so there's a, little, there's a little sort of flavor of that in this dream. You know, that something, um, something is really amiss, and it seems to be amiss. I, I'm going um, I, 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 to tend to see this the same way the dreamer sees it, that it, it, it tend, I, I believe this dream is commenting on an outer world experience of feeling um, uh, uh, stifled by an ideology that the thing about ideology is it usually cuts us off from the past. If you think about major ideological movements like Maoism, for example, but really, or, you know, the, 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 the ideology during the French revolution or, you know, just it either connects you with a false past like Nazism did, or it cuts you off and renders uh, uh, sort of irrelevant, uh, you know, the, the real past. You know, you could think about people pulling down statues in that way, too. So there's, there's something, there is a past here. There's an, there are ancient temples and schools, but mm -hmm. they're being improved. But something, exactly. in, something there doesn't like it. So I'll shut up right. for now. I'm kind of rambling, <laughs> but that's how this dream right. hit me. I, I, th um, I agree with you, Lisa. And I'm thinking about the paradox here of, uh, y you know, the cognitive dissonance, rather, right yeah. in the initial setting of the dream. I'm the newest addition to a historic preservation crew, quote, improving, unquote, temples and schools of a bygone people and culture. Well, if you're a part of a historic preservation crew, your mission is to be attentive and devoted to what the intent of the bygone peoples and culture was. You don't improve it. You don't make modifications. And people on um, uh, archaeological digs use these tiny little brushes to brush off, uh, you know, sand or dirt so as not to damage in even the slightest way uh, an object or a new layer of, of the dig. Uh, it, it is being preserved and honored. And that's not what's going on in the stream. And there it is right in the initial situation. Uh, the psychic situation, which is, um, it's not historic preservation, it's alteration. And that is what ideology does. It tells us this is good or right or valuable, um, and it ain't necessarily so. It's what we want it to be with whatever kind of ego dominance is taking place on the part of a group or uh, creators of an ideology or a culture that, that there are uh, essential truths that must not be questioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can really align with this possibility that the dream is a collective commentary, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it's remarkable when sometimes people dream on behalf of a larger issue. Um, just to open up, another dimension of yes. it, I'm going to just assume that the dream in, in this past is purely intrapsychic, that there's something just going on on a personal level mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. And so they're going, he's going deeper into the Sierra Nevada mountains, and the deeper he goes, the more intense things become and the more haunted he mm. becomes. Mm. So hauntings in general and ghosts can be interpreted as complexes. 
they are this remnants of people that are no longer there, which is really exactly what a complex is. Um, we have um, thousands of memories of an individual person, let's say a, a, a father or a mother, and even if they are still biologically alive and we go off to college, live somewhere else, we are haunted by the internal mm -hmm. representations of those experiences. So, most importantly, that the complexes that are affecting the psyche are invisible. And therein lay the primary problem. Yeah. And I think the great venture of all forms of analysis, of Freudian, Jungian, Lacanian, is trying to make the invisible visible because we mm. are affected mm -hmm. by all kinds of memories and feelings, and more so when we can't get a glimpse of them. So we're beginning to see the effects of these unvisualized feeling states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that they um, evoke this feeling of harassment. I'm not sure what he means by molestation. That has many different valences. Mm -hmm. And that the nightly hauntings are creating severe acne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, for most of us, acne is part of puberty. That um, with this enormous upsurge of testosterone, mm -hmm. this overproduction of sebum in the skin and other things, produces this intense acne, and for this person, really bruising, um, swelling all over the face. But acne comes from the deeper layer of the skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people think it has something to do with keeping the face clean, but it's not. It's um, way down in the dermis. There's an overstimulation of the functioning of the skin, and things tr are trying to break out from the surface. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the invisible becoming visible. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. And, and it's difficult. And, and I think there is no lysis in the dream yet that we're just in the beginning of a growing demand in the psyche to tolerate the tension of something that that's trying to talk to this mm -hmm. person. And, um, and there's a decision there that, why am I staying on the mission? Yep. Why, why don't I just get the heck out of Dodge? And that, that's really great, Joseph. And I, you know, I, I like, I like your taking it to the personal realm. And I, I want to say too, maybe related is, you know, the other thing about acne is like you said, it's kind of associated with um, puberty. So, so is there, is there a little hearkening mm -hmm. back to adolescence here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or an adolescent frame of mind, or d does it, does it speak to something that was true for the dreamer at that time of life? There's some, some things being kind of infantilized in some way or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about the acne and the facial distortion as the price that persona has to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the face we turn to the world, uh, you know, something that is pleasant and neutral and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden um, that is being, uh, you know, demonstrably uh, flawed and, um, you know, announcing to the world, this is not okay. I think I also want to mention that, you know, I think what the, our dreamer is saying in the dream too is, um, being gaslighted. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and there's something where he says at the very end, um, you know, that he, he's being denied the truth of the situation. Well, you know, uh, what's the truth? Uh, we mm -hmm. could go, we could go around and around and around on that. But, um, there are a number of people in my life who feel coerced to remain silent or provide lip service uh, to a community or workplace uh, set of values that they may not agree with 
And universally, of these, the people that I know, and we're just talking a handful of people, so it's a big generalization to make, but uh, is the objection is there is no dialogue. We're not communicating about it. How do we talk about it? Rather than people feeling that there is an overlay of truth and rightness and justice and, you know, a bunch of other sort of virtuous seeming values uh, that, that are um, doctrinal in some situations. And what I would suggest is along those lines is this preservation of some ancient temples. <laughs> to me, it sounds like a religious conflict. And it's not uncommon, particularly mm. for young men who are in the midst of a sexual awakening, if you are part of a religious context that insists on purity or demonizes sexuality, it's a time of enormous conflict mm. as to whether or not uh, sexual experimentation is permitted or whether it's damned in, in terms that are very, very frightening. So I think there is, where I would be curious with this dreamer is, to go back to the early sexual conflicts, that when you began to wake to your own sexual dynamism, what kinds of thoughts, what kinds of religious beliefs, social beliefs, made your own sexuality seem like a dangerous creature that would come out at night and mm. harass and frighten and and I think possibly the naming is it's your sexuality. That that that's the thing that no one is saying. <laughs> and in many religious households, there is sadly a belief that if we keep children ignorant of sexuality, somehow that keeps sexuality away from them. So we don't talk about <laughs> sexuality or we don't talk about sexual identity in any form at all. And then what happens is sexuality then becomes a kind of unnamed and invisible tension that comes to visit and frighten. And it hasn't been named. So I, I would offer that as one possibility to the dreamer. I'm also aware that our dreamer is a project manager, and at at the end, uh, he adds to his association's uh, contractor work. So that may be, you know, as a project manager, part of what he does. And um, so I'm interested in uh, what's a contractor, and what do you contract for? And in his dream, there are people um, who leave. Uh, and uh, the senior people are are disdainful than that. He says some members of the outfit abandon the job, and they face ridicule from the other bosses. Um, and then he says, I'm scared. I question my own allegiance to the company and why I'm even here at all. Uh, so it raises the question of what is our dreamer contracting for mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, symbolically? What's the deal? What's the deal? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, workplaces have always had the ability to mandate certain things. Um, I'm old enough to remember people who worked for IBM back in the day. Mm -hmm. There was a dress code. A and uh, guys wore shirts and ties and jackets and women dressed a certain way. And if you were a woman back then, you had to, quote, dress for success in a skirted suit. And uh, the, what's the deal that undergirds mm. that deal that looks like it's all perfectly proper, perfectly nice, professional? Really? What's, what else is going on here? And what, what does an employee really contract for unconsciously? as well as doing the nine to five part of the job consciously. What part are we being asked to buy into?